This is part three of my chest radiology board review. I have 10 cases. Each case has one or a few questions, and I'm going to give you 10 seconds for each question. Let's go over the answers. Case 21. So here the setup was trauma, and the question was, how long will this take to resolve? So this abnormality is a pulmonary laceration, and you could see it's the same density as the SVC because this is active extravasation within the pulmonary laceration. This right here is contusion right next to it. This is pleural fluid. There's a chest tube in here and you can see that there's subcutaneous emphysema as well. So the answer to this question is a few months. Pulmonary lacerations are simply just tears in the lung, and oftentimes on the initial chest x-ray they're hard to see because they're filled with fluid and they're surrounded by pulmonary contusion. Over time they may become loosened as the contusion or the blood um, goes away, and uh, the blood within the laceration goes away. But these usually resolve in a few months, and that's opposed to contusion, which usually gets better in one or two days and then fully resolves in one to two weeks. Case 22. So these next two questions were about lung cancer screening. So in this patient, a clinician wants to order a test for a smoker who presents with hoarseness and they're a 35-pack year smoking history, and they're 68 years old. So the correct answer here is chest CT with contrast. And the reason why you don't want to do a lung cancer screening CT is because they're not asymptomatic. 
You wouldn't really want to do chest radiography here because they have a high pretest probability for lung cancer with this hoarseness and with their smoking history. A high resolution chest CT is for interstitial lung disease, and then a PET CT is probably premature at this point. So this is a separate patient, and the question was, a seven millimeter nodule on initial lung cancer screening was found. What is the next step? The answer is six month follow-up. So you should know the Medicare Medicaid eligibility criteria for lung cancer screening. It's ages 55 to 77, asymptomatic patients, meaning that no signs or symptoms of lung cancer. They have to have at least a 30 pack year smoking history and either be a current smoker or a former smoker who has quit smoking within the last 16, 15 years. So if they quit 16 years ago, then they're in a, ineligible based on Medicare Medicaid. And then you should know a little bit about lung rads criteria. And I would know the lung rads criteria for solid nodules, which is if it's less than six millimeters, then it's 12 month follow up. If it's six or seven millimeters, then it's six month follow up. And if it's eight millimeters or above, then it's either a three month follow up, PET, or, or biopsy. Case 23 Which of these is an atoll? The correct answer is D. This is an atoll sign. This right here is a CT halo sign, so a nodule with ground glass around it. This is a teratoma, so a lesion in the anterior mediastinum with fat and soft tissue, and this is just a cavity. Which of these is in the differential for an atoll? You probably guessed this, that all of the above are in the differential. So an atoll sign is a sign in which you have consolidation in the perimeter of the lesion and central ground glass opacity or central clearing. And these can be associated with many entities, although they're most closely associated with organizing pneumonia, although they're not pathognomonic. But the differential includes things like mucor and other fungal infections, lung cancer, and pulmonary infarct. Case 24. What is the next step here? So here we have a rounded area of lung associated with volume loss. We have pulling in of the major fissure, and you can see here that there's a little bit of pleural thickening. It, that actually doesn't come through that well, but you can see vaguely that there's pleural thickening. So the next best step is to follow this up in six months. And PET-CT is not something you want to do here because we have classic signs of round uh, round atelectasis. You wouldn't want to biopsy or refer to thoracic surgery. So this is associated with the comet tail sign. B was the correct answer. The silhouette sign is usually something we refer to in, radio in radiography instead of CT. Incomplete border sign is a sign of something in the pleura, in which it's usually in within a fissure. That's the incomplete border sign. The split pleura sign is a sign of an empyema on CT. Which of these is associated with round atelectasis? The best answer here is asbestos-related pleural disease. Usually, if patients have pleural plaques and asbestos-related uh, pleural disease, then they will have areas of round atelectasis. So these are the four criteria for calling round atelectasis. Volume loss, um, and we have that here by pulling in of the major fissure. The abnormality is next to the pleura. Okay. Um, there, the pleura is abnormal here, and a comet tail appearance. A comet tail appearance just means that there's swirling of the vessels and the bronchi leading into the round atelectasis. Case 25. This abnormality can be secondary to what infection? The answer here is Chagas disease. So this is a chalasia. Okay, so we have dilatation of the esophagus here with an air fluid level. This is the trachea. This is the right lateral aspect of the esophageal wall. So this patient is at risk for esophageal cancer. So achalasia is a disease in which the lower esophageal sphincter is impaired. This is the classic bird's beak sign on fluoroscopy. And what you'll see usually on chest radiographs are a widened esophagus with an air fluid level. And it's important to note there's no clips here. So sometimes this you can see something that looks like this with an intrathoracic stomach if a patient has had an esophagectomy with a gastric pull-up. But notice we don't see any clips here. And I'm guessing that if you get 
shown one of those, then you're probably going to have a history of some kind of surgery or prior esophageal cancer. And these patients are at 50 times increased risk of esophageal cancer. And here's just the lateral view showing that the air fluid level is right here and it's bowing the um, trachea forward. Case 26, true or false, this person will be infertile. So if you looked at all the clues here, you'll notice that this person is a female and the answer here is false, okay? Um, so the signs here are we have situs and verses, so we have the heart on the right side and we have the stomach bubble in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. And in the lower lungs, we have what looks like bronchiectasis and kind of a reticulonodular pattern in the lower lungs. So this is a patient with immodal cilia. What percentage of patients with this disease will present with situs inversus? The answer is 50%. So immodal cilia syndrome is also called dyskinetic cilia syndrome, and they these patients present with chronic infection, usually going back to childhood because of poor mucociliary clearance. Half of these patients with immodal cilia will have situs inversus, and then infertility is something that only happens in men because of immodal spermatozoa, and patients will have basal or bronchiectasis on chest x-ray or CT. Case 27. This is a 35-year-old male. What is the most likely diagnosis? So the abnormality here was that, first of all, the lungs are hyperinflated. You could see that just by, you know, gestalt, or you can count the ribs. There's too many ribs here. And then the other abnormality is that the lower lungs are hyperlucent, especially over here and over here. And in the right lower lung, you can see these rounded uh, lucencies, and these are big bulla. So this is a patient with alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. Tracheobronchomegaly, if you look at the trachea, this trachea looks normal in, in size, so I would rule that out. LAM is a disease that is only seen in females, so you could rule that out. Cystic fibrosis is incorrect because I don't really see any abnormality in the upper lungs here. I don't see any bronchiectasis. And then asthma would probably be the last thing to rule out. The reason why this is an asthma is it doesn't really explain these bulla down here in the right lower lung. The next question is, what is the most common extrapulmonary site? So the answer here is liver disease. So uh, pancreas is associated with cystic fibrosis, kidneys, tuberous sclerosis, or Berthog dubé sinuses, maybe GPA, colon uh, is just a red herring. These patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency have an unchecked elastase activity in the lungs causing a destruction of the lungs that looks like emphysema. And the disease is accelerated by smoking, so patients who are only 30 or 40 years old will look like they are 60 or 70 years old and lifetime smokers. These patients will present with a basilar predominant emphysema with Bullis disease, and it's important to note that there's multiple genetic variants, and 10 to 15% will have liver involvement, and that can include hepatitis, cirrhosis, and HCC. This is the lateral view showing flattening of the diaphragm. The question is, what is this? And I'm pointing to this little bump right here, and this is something called an aortic nipple, and that just represents the left superior intercostal vein, which can be dilated in patients with SVC obstruction. Okay, so that's called the aortic nipple. It's a systemic vein. Case 29. So the question was, which contour is abnormal? And there's a line here that is abnormal, and that's the azigoesophageal line. You can see as it continues up, it goes into this dilated structure here, which is the azygous vein. So this is not actually the paravertebral line, which you may have thought of. And the reason why we know that is because you can see here that it's medial to some of these vertebral bodies. So that's why it's not the right paravertebral line. So anterior junction line would be right here, and that's normal. The AP window here is normal. The azygoesophageal line is the correct answer, and posterior junction line, I don't actually see it on this case, but it would be something that's right here. On CT, we have this dilated tubular structure here, and it's in the posterior mediastinum. We know that because we have vertebral bodies, we have esophagus, we have uh, the descending aorta. Thoracic duct obstruction is incorrect. This is too dense to be the thoracic duct. Chagas disease, so you could see that with achalasia as I showed you before. 
Esophageal cancer is incorrect. This is the esophagus here, which is normal. So IVC obstruction or interruption or absence is the correct answer here. The diagnosis here is azagous continuation of the IVC. So this is an absence or occlusion of the IVC with the renal veins draining into a dilated retrocrural azagous vein. The hepatic veins drain either directly into the right atrium or a short segment of a remnant of the IVC. And this can be associated with heterotaxy, although most cases are usually just isolated. So here's the chest x-ray again and the corresponding CT showing you a dilated azagous vein. And then here's the CT that goes al along with it. So we don't see the IVC here. The renal veins drain into the azagous vein, and I'm showing it to you here, which is dilated. Case 30. What is the most likely diagnosis? This is a patient with lung cancer and a new left upper lobe opacity. They're on an immune checkpoint inhibitor called dervalumab. It's not necessary to know that this is an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Let's go through the answer choices true progression of lung cancer. So if this were a metastatic disease, it's not really going to show up as a ground glass consolidative opacity. More likely, it's going to be a solid nodule. So that's not a good answer choice. Pseudoprogression is a phenomenon that occurs in patients with immune checkpoint inhibitors, but the usual presentation of pseudoprogression is a temporary increase in size of lymph nodes or the primary mass. It usually doesn't show up as a separate airspace opacity. Okay, so pseudoprogression is not a good answer choice here. Drug-induced pneumonitis is the correct answer. It's showing up as an area of what looks like organizing pneumonia with a peripheral area of slightly higher density and a central area of slightly lower density. So that's the best answer choice here. Drug-induced sarcoid is a potential answer choice. However, this doesn't really look like sarcoid. Sarcoid in the lungs is usually going to present with small nodules with a perilymphatic distribution, or it's going to present with enlarged mediastinal or hilar lymph nodes. So that's not really the best answer choice. Drug-induced pneumonitis from chemotherapy commonly presents as organizing pneumonia. It can also present with these other patterns, NSIP, diffuse alveolar damage, or hypersensitivity pneumonitis, but these are less common. And most of the cases are responsive to discontinuation of the drugs and steroids, but some cases are severe. And you can see that this patient at uh, one month later almost completely resolved, just a little bit of faint ground glass opacity remaining. All right, so that was the last question in this part three of my board review series. If anybody has any questions, please leave them in the comments below.